Okay, welcome to the May edition of our ISAC Talks, our monthly youth-led conversations about cultural heritage. My name is Elisabetta Maistri, and I will moderate today's talk on digital transformation and cultural heritage. Before diving into this very timely topic, a few announcements. First of all, our ESA quarterly issue number two is now available. And for those of you who are interested, you can find the link paste in the chat. Our second announcement is about Europa Nostra and its youth partners launched a consultation on youth for the future of cultural heritage in Europe invitation to take the survey in order to have a say in crafting our future. And also this uh, link can be found in the chat. The third announcement regards the uh, International Museum Day. EHYA have a Did You Know campaign ready and check out our social media to find a lot of more interesting stuff and even lesser known things to discover. Uh, I would like you to know that today's event has been developed in collaboration with Europeana and we have Georgia Evans here with us who will give us a short introduction to Europeana and how their work fits into the digital transformation of cultural heritage. So if uh, Georgia, you want to... Yes. Hi, thank you so much. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we do. Yes. Um, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. It's such a pleasure to um, to uh, always attend these Sex Talks events. So um, it's really fantastic to have been able to do one um, in close collaboration. Um, so I won't speak for too long, but um, my name is Georgia and I'm um, editorial officer at the Europeana Foundation. Um, and I'm also um, leading on work to try and kind of explore different ways that we can be supporting new professionals across the cultural heritage sector. Um, and with that, it's always uh, really fantastic to, um, to work with ESAC. Um, so if you've attended an ESAC talks before, you might have come across Europeana. We've had speakers speaking about various things at them. Um, but in the time I have, I just wanted to give a very uh, brief introduction uh, to Europeana and, and also to digital transformation itself. And then uh, I look forward to handing over to Sophie, who will be able to also provide much more, uh, much more fantastic information. So just if you're not familiar with Europeana, uh, it's an organisation um, that works on all things digital cultural heritage. So we work to support um, cultural heritage institutions across Europe to bring their collections online, um, to work in digital ways, and then to encourage uh, people across Europe, educators, researchers, the public, young people to really enjoy and use those collections that have been uh, made available digitally. And our mission is to empower the cultural heritage sector in its digital transformation. So digital transformation is uh, obviously uh, very relevant to everything we do. It's literally our mission. Um, and so that was uh, really fantastic, again, to be able to do this talking collaboration with ESAC to share it. But um, something that I thought was quite an, maybe a natural start for this ESAC talks is to kind of... Um, give an understanding of what Europeana defines digital transformation as. I think that's the first question is what is digital transformation? Um, and working um, across the sector, um, in consultation across the sector and doing research, Europeana has suggested a definition of digital transformation, um, which I would like to share briefly with you now to kick off the talk. So let me share my screen. And I hope my fellow speakers can nod and say that you, uh, you can see the screen. So I will start the video. Digital transformation is both the process and the result of using digital technology to transform how an organization works. It helps an organization to thrive, fulfill its mission and meet the needs of its stakeholders. Digital transformation can be driven by heritage professionals of any level. Everyone can be an agent of change. It is not just about technology, it's about mindsets and personal capabilities. The impact of digital transformation will be different for each individual organisation. Each change, no matter how small, contributes to a cultural heritage sector powered by digital and a Europe powered by culture. Europeana's focus is on digital transformation relating to the digital discovery of cultural heritage collections. This includes, but is not limited to, efforts that help cultural heritage institutions to develop their leadership and capacity for digital transformation, 
to strengthen infrastructure, improve interoperability, enrich data, share collections and engage with audiences. Europeana empowers the cultural heritage sector in its digital transformation, helping it to embrace digital change and encouraging partnerships that foster innovation. We lead with our specialist expertise when appropriate and collaborate when that expertise lies in other networks. Do you want to know more about our work? Then go to pro.europeana.eu. Great. So um, I hope that uh, video just gives kind of a, a starting point, I guess, because I, that's Europeana's definition, but of course be interested to know how that fits with your own understandings and discussions as well. Um, but there's just one point from that video that I really wanted to pick up on from the definition, which is that digital transformation can be driven by heritage professionals at any level. Everyone can be an agent of change. And I think that's really relevant for where we are this evening and with working, you know, with organisations like ESAC, that whether you're a student, whether you're new to the cultural heritage sector, a new professional, that everyone can benefit from and contribute to digital transformation. Um, and I think that's something that I hope we'll be uh, hearing from our speakers um, tonight as well. So I will leave it there. Thank you so much for listening. And um, yeah, I really look forward to, uh, to hearing from my speakers going forward. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Georgia. Um, so um, I, without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce you to our keynote and our free ESAC speaker. But before doing that, I will remind you a few house rules, um, which is, um, that this talk will be recorded and uploaded onto our YouTube channel. So if you'd like to remain anonymous, please uh, mind you of your cameras switched off at all times. Um, I see that we are quite a few, so please be sure that your mic is switched off uh, during, your present uh, during the presentations. Um, the Q&A will be at the end of all presentations and for those of you who are able to stay, if you can, if you can either tap your uh, question, comment into the chat and we will read it out loud or if you prefer instead to address your question directly, you can always raise your hand and ask your question or make a comment yourself. Um, we will end this event by 20, uh, by 20 o'clock, but if, you, if we are running out of time and you didn't have time to ask your question, make your comment, uh, there is always the possibility for you to email us and we can keep the conversation going um, through emails. Uh, so now let me introduce you to um, our keynote speaker for the day, which is uh, Sophie Tess. And after Sophie, we will leave the floor to our speakers, who are uh, Ima Drum, Raffaella De Marco, and Miranda uh, Zinzike. I hope that I pronounced the surname Right, but I'm not entirely convinced. Um, so let's start with Sophie Paez, who is an alumna of KU Louvain in Belgium, where she graduated in musicology and medieval and Renaissance studies. Currently, she is working at the Institute for Cultural Studies at the KU Louvain and at the Photo Consortium, which is a Europeana's thematic aggregator for photography as a digital curator. She has curated a wide range of editorials and virtual exhibitions for Europeana, as well as the physical exhibition, All Our Yesterdays, Thousands Are Sailing, and Blue Skies, Red Time. Currently, she's active in several European projects involving digital and cultural heritage and uh, user engagement strategies, among which we uh, F, Citizen Heritage and Indices. Uh, Sophie, if you want to share your screen, the floor is yours. I hope uh, that my slideshow is on. Uh, can Georgia, yes. I see you in the top of my screen. Thank you so much. And thank you also, guys, for uh, for having me tonight. I mean, it's such a, an honor and a pleasure, really, because I get to talk about, yeah, let's say the digital transformation of Sophie, which very much uh, is a trip of a lifetime that has been enabled, eh, just to be straight about it, through all the projects that I've been able to do for and in the ecosystem of Europeana over the past almost 10 years. 
and I will um, share different parts of my journey with you. Maybe they can uh, give you a glimpse of uh, how a person who comes from a very different background ends up in digital cultural heritage. Uh, to start this journey, I have to start here. Uh, as uh, Elisaveta already alluded to, I'm actually a musicologist. So my background is in music performance, but also in music history, sociology, uh, theory, um, uh, broad musical studies that I did at KU Leuven, Leuven University. Um, I stayed on there for 10 years, actually, as a researcher in medieval and Renaissance studies. Before um, I embarked upon um, new adventures, and the slide I'm showing here is actually something that remains of my days as a musicological researcher. It's a small business that I have on my own, a freelance business uh, as a music uh, writer. So I'm a journalist for uh, one of the largest Belgian newspapers on music. I write CD booklets. I've published a book on early music. I give concert introductions and all um, those kind of activities in the realm of classical music. But what I want to talk to you about today is a shift that happened in uh, 2013. When I switched research groups from musicology, I went to uh, cultural studies and more precisely uh, the cultural studies department uh, rebaptized into digital humanities. And this is how I landed in my first project for uh, Europeana as a digital curator. And when I say digital curator, this might sound a little bit fishy because what do you curate digitally? Well, basically in the realm of Europeana, it's aggregated collections of uh, digital cultural heritage, whether those are photos, this is my specialism, but also audiovisual material, texts, uh, arts, pieces of arts, uh, think of it, name it, and it's somewhere there across the 50 million plus objects on Europeana that I'm so fortunate uh, as to be able to work with every single day. First project that was Europeana photography. I stumbled in there somehow in 2013 when the project was already running. And because I was used from my researcher days to tell stories about and with um, heritage collections, of course, I come from this musical background. Now I went to a photography related um, uh, uh, sphere but I still got to do the storytelling. And so when they were looking for somebody to put together an exhibition about the first 100 years of uh, photography using brand new uh, collections in Europeana, somehow that turned out to be me. Um, we created the exhibition All Our Yesterdays, and those of you who are keen travelers perhaps recognize here the airport of uh, Pisa, where we have a partner at the Graphic Museum that was so brave as to put on this photography exhibition by this very unweathered uh, digital curator. And we had an amazing display, as you can see here on the right. Uh, seeing that first exhibition come to life was one of the most uh, exciting experiences uh, I've ever had. We also had the opportunity to publish uh, a beautiful and uh, substantial catalog. So, uh, and we were able, as you see here on the left, to organize some educational activities with uh, elementary schools, uh, high school students and so on. We even organized a collection day with a broader audience where people could bring in their photo albums, have them digitized, and of course, with their agreement, contribute those digitized heirlooms to Europeana as a really community-fed um, initiative for expanding the photographic collections on Europeana. So this was my, my, uh, my baptism, uh, so to speak, which was immediately continued with Europeana Space, a project very much targeted to a different corner, let's say, of the cultural heritage um, sector, namely SMEs, creative industries, um, where we developed some new user engagement strategies and the tools that you see here, they really are uh, interactive tools 
to attract new audiences to cultural heritage, for instance, by producing pop-up exhibitions that can be operated by smartphones and having a discussion tool a bit in the style of Mentimeter, where you can quiz people on their insights and their opinions on uh, cultural heritage items and collections. In a follow-up project, Europeana Migration, um, I very much became aware of a broader societal relevance of what we are doing in this cultural heritage sector. It's not only about look at my, my beautiful collections, uh, come on to my uh, website and um, explore what we have collected for you here. No, we are aiming with uh, our cultural heritage work at a broader societal impact and definitely with a topic such as migration around which we established a new thematic collection. Um, this came very much to the forefront of the work that we're doing in the sector. Again, we created uh, exhibitions both uh, on Europeana digitally, but also physically. Again, we were welcomed at the Museo della Grafica in Pisa, and we were able to take this exhibition on the road. Uh, here you see me at uh, our university halls in Leuven, where we reproduced the exhibition together with a plugin, a co-creative plugin that was produced by KU Leuven students. I also hit the road um, to uh, interview a few ambassadors of migration uh, stories in uh, Europe. And I interviewed, among others, this uh, quite famous Belgian politician who has um, um, uh, an amazing life story that I find truly inspirational and that you can now read and, uh, all about in Europeana. I think at this point, I really experienced this kind of landslide, a shift in what I was doing in my day-to-day -day work towards uh, incorporating the new participatory approaches uh, towards Europeana end users, really this community engagement that now is at the, at the center of what we call the Culture 3.0 approach. And in its wake also emerged a new view of what is cultural heritage. Uh, it's not only, as I said, about publishing collections, having rich metadata, creating stories, producing exhibitions, of course, of course, all of that is important. But it's even more important to put all that to use of expressing identities identities that are self-constructed by communities and no longer imposed upon by a societal canon that in many respects is a misconstructed canon full of uh, misrepresentations. So this landslide definitely um, proved to be more than a trend, eh? more uh, really a reality in our cultural heritage work. In this project, the 1950s in Europe Kaleidoscope, where we tried to um, disambiguate this very black and white sense of history that we have about Europe in the 1950s as being um, caught between the blue skies and the red panic with the iron curtain in between. We involved the crowd or the end users or the citizens of Europe even more by, among others, uh, having some crowdsourcing campaigns where people could contribute annotations uh, to cultural heritage objects. And why is this important? Because you allow people to self-express and to use the words, the terms, the descriptions that they find representative for their own heritage. We also developed some fun interactive uh, tools, such as this uh, uh, smartphone tool that allows you to take a photograph and then launches this uh, algorithm into Europeana collections, finding some images that it recommends to you that could be of interest. Again, an exhibition, Blue Skies, Red Panic, um, with a catalog and different productions. We had, uh, we revisited Pisa. We were able to go to the KU Leuven campus uh, in Antwerp. And we had an opportunity to reproduce the exhibition, not only at the Centre Merque Cultural in Girona, in Spain, 
and in the very famous photo museum of Berlin, but also, and that's where the current uh, exhibition, the er, exhibition is still currently running in the Ludwig Erhard Centrum in Fürth, Germany. We went on for an amazing, amazing journey across 10 countries in Europe, uh, following up on the European Year of Cultural Heritage 2018. So it was me who had the honor to go to 10 local communities for 10 co-creative workshops and 10 pop-up exhibitions. Uh, you can see it was really um, an, a pan-European effort where I worked with high school students in Budapest on the great uh, revolution of uh, 89. And you can see here how we try to make uh, really with a hands-on approach um, end users accustomed to the collections through innovative applications. In Sofia, I worked with children with a hearing um, impairment that just got implanted a hearing aid, but are not used to interacting or even reacting to uh, the spoken word or anything that is uh, sound related. So we managed to co-create with them an exhibition on the Cyrillic alphabet. It's one of the, of my, the life experiences that I will never ever uh, shake off. In Hemenlina, Finland, we worked with um, former prison guards as well as former prisoners. We brought them together in a safe environment to share their life stories and to find cultural collections that helped underpin and express those stories. In Vilnius, I worked with art students. In Girona, with senior citizens, member of a sports association. In Nicosia, with the Maronite community and in the end was able to uh, talk to European Commissioner Maria Gabriel, who really had a warm heart for this whole uh, project. And then I move very close to the present. Actually, today we had the validation meeting uh, with the European Commission for this project, Europeana XX, a very society-oriented project where we wanted to make 20th century black hole in heritage um, disappear or uh, become a bit more uh, filled with AV collections from Europeana aggregators. We did again a range of novel activities such as produce a vlog and a podcast, uh, have a subtitle ton where people could uh, contribute multilingual subtitles to videos uh, from our aggregators. And we had an exhibition on the, uh, on the contraceptive pill that was developed by students and then turned into a Europeana exhibition. In the same uh, year, we did um, a project on Chinese collections preserved in Europe. And I think this was important because we are looking further and further away, realizing more and more what is European cultural heritage. It's so much more than the traditional views that we have of this kind of uh, content. We expanded our experience in crowdsourcing annotations from within the community. We challenged some students to promote these crowdsourcing efforts and they did it via a video contest with amazing uh, interactions with Europeana content. And here I saw emerge some new responsibilities eh? because uh, Sometimes we see, and we definitely saw it in this uh, China-related project, that not all content is suitable for um, being consumed without contextualization. It's so important to voice, actually, the community context that goes with cultural heritage collections, especially in the digital atmosphere, that we need new practices, new strategy. For instance, we need external advisory boards. We need community-rooted advice when we are working on potentially sensitive collections of which we do not understand everything. We need to create safe environments. We need to label content. We need to use controlled uh, and well-informed thesauri. These are all lessons learned uh, on this trip of a lifetime. 
And then currently my projects are uh, in the realms of citizen science. So this is taking crowdsourcing practices, I would say, to a next level. Another one is WEAF, we are where we are working with intangible heritage and uh, heritage of uh, mis minoritized communities such as the Roma. And finally, INDICES is uh, very much oriented towards policymakers and cultural heritage institutions who want to embark upon a process of digital transformation. So here we are sharing best practices, tools and means of uh, communication for um, emerging CHIs, young professionals, but also established institutions that really embrace digital transformation. So what is next? Uh, we submitted yesterday uh, some Digital Europe program uh, proposals. So I hope that new projects are coming. Uh, we will be more and more focusing on this community driven approach uh, on safeguarding digital cultural heritage. So we are working with Europeana on helping Ukrainian uh, colleagues to um, safeguard their collections and to emerge from the terrible crisis that they're in um, with um, uh, a strengthened uh, heritage community, actually. And of course, I am uh, as contributing as much as I can to the debates on the emerging common data space for cultural heritage. What I hope to be doing is to share my passion uh, in, the, in the near and the further future for photography, for Europeana and for this uh, beautiful sector. I want to support Ukrainian uh, colleagues indeed in uh, overcoming this crisis and strengthening our collaborations. I am as a vice chair of the Europeana Network Association very much committed to this amazing bunch of people and helping them in any digital endeavor they might have. And I want to perhaps give as a final takeaway uh, for you guys that the journey is something to embrace, even if it uh, encompasses some jumps and some big changes that you did not expect. Really embrace it with passion because passion is a real asset in this sector where you only become more credible and more relevant to your peers when you really show that uh, cultural heritage and culture is something that is not only in your mind, but also in your heart. And I'm a little bit over time, I think. I'm sorry about that, but that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. This presentation has surely given us a lot of food for thoughts to all of us, so don't worry if there was a little bit of, you know, running out of time. Actually, you were perfect. So uh, it is now time for me to introduce you to uh, Iman Drum that will talk, uh, talk us about measuring internet discourse on Tierlieu in France. Uh, let me first uh, briefly introduce uh, Iman. He's a urban uh, planner and policy analyst. He has worked at the UNESCO World Heritage Center in the energy sector on energy efficiency and uh, urban regeneration and for urban planning cons uh, consultancies. He studied planning and poli uh, public policy at Science Po at the University of uh, Paris de Sorbonne and at the University of Virginia. Iman, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, and thank you to ESAC and Europeana for this opportunity to speak. Um, I'll be sharing some recent work that I've done with um, a colleague of mine. At, uh, I'm at Sciences Po and he's at uh, Central European University in Vienna. Um, I'm working on public policy and specifically on analyzing public policies. Um, and to that end, we're, we've been um, tackling the topic of Tierlieu, which are um, third spaces, um, as you might know from Ray Oldenburg's uh, sociological classification. Um, in France, they've come to have a particular meaning, which is sites that are being redeveloped, uh, urban sites in particular, but not only, that are being redeveloped um, into mixed-use housing and cultural spaces um, during the time when they're 
undergoing the permitting process. Um, they are occupied by cultural organizations, um, uh, nonprofit associations, community-based groups. And so we're looking at this phenomenon as a new approach to urban development, but also as cultural infrastructure. Um, and from the digital angle, um, we've well, I, I wanted to look at specifically how people talk about them online, um, since increasingly that's part of the um the, their online presence makes um is is both part of their mission uh, but even is how many people interact with these spaces so um as you can see tlu like this notion of these third spaces really evolved um in the past 10 years um and so we're taking the the, the work that i'm going to present today um is based on their uh, online presence um how people talk about them on social media essentially but also about how they're categorized by themselves there's a, a site uh, increasingly the French state is, has been supporting these sites um, and the uh, permitting process and um, the kind of uh, administrative infrastructure that goes with creating a cultural space in um, in, a, in a brownfield urban site. Um, and so we've been looking at how they how they talk about themselves online, what their mission is, what their values are, and how that compares to what people um, what people say about them. And so the, what I'm going to share today is um, oh, just this is uh, to say that there's been a lot of focus on their economic impact, um, how how they create jobs, and they do have a, a significant impact in cities um, in terms of keeping space available for art arts based, community based, uh, nonprofit associations. Um, particularly in gentrifying cities like Paris and Marseille. Uh, this is a, an image from Marseille in France. There's a site called Coco Belton, which is a former municipal roadworks department, which has been occupied by um, 40 um, artists and uh, association, nonprofit associations for the last two years. Um, but what I wanted to look at was more, how can we use the data that's produced online about these spaces to understand their impacts? Um, and we did this i was again with ankar my colleague but um at, at my initiative we've been working on um looking at some some research that was done elsewhere um this is a diagram from uh yuan lai who's a researcher at nyu um in the us but who took who did um some natural language processing and uh topic modeling data analysis um of all of the planning applications um for buildings in in new york city and was able to um, see change over time in terms of the types of projects that were um, that were focused on, uh, and so in doing so, we can understand trends in um, in the way that building renovation um, takes place, but also the things that are getting more funding, more more attention, uh, more more space in the political discourse. Um, so for our projects, for our experiment this time around, um, we worked on two different sources of data. One being Commune Museum, which is a website, a publicly funded website for. Um, these kind of TLU, these cultural spaces to basically talk about themselves, define what they mean, their mission, uh, what they do, uh, also to say what they think their impact is. And we kind of, we crossed that data, we cross-referenced it with um, all of the tweets about um, about uh, TLU. So all, in, in, in the 10 years that TLU have been a topic, there's been about 24,000 tweets uh, total that have mentioned TLU. So we looked at um, how, what kind of information can we glean from these uh, spaces um, by looking at those trends over time um, and cutting the information in different ways. And so basically, um, when you do this kind of work, you have to train a model to um, uh, sort of bring out topics. And using an English language corpus, uh, we trained the model that we built uh, in Python to um, tell us basically what are the main topics that are emerge from uh, the Twitter corpus, especially. And you can see that given the, this, this graph shows that there's more and more tweets over time up until the pandemic when they dropped off significantly. In 2022, it, it drops off, but it's just because there's this data is from earlier this year, so there's not as many as there would be. But there's been a change over time and some trends we've noticed in terms of how people tweet about uh, TRU. And um, so it's, it's gone from talking about sort of like new things, and this is in French, uh, sorry for those who don't speak French, but I'll translate in real time, uh, sort of new to a project-based approach in space uh, to one that's focused on territorial development, so local area, uh, local area development. And so these projects are becoming mainstream, they're becoming part of the political discourse. When we train the model differently using a French language corpus, it interestingly has a very different, um, uh, the topics that, that emerge are different. However, there is the same trend in time, uh, moving from one that's focused on work to one that's focused on a sort of discourse about innovation to one that's focused on digital and digital space. Um, this is just 
this was kind of background information for our research, but um, this what I've just shown and what I'm showing now, um, there's there was a lot of emphasis on work. So a lot of these spaces are also workspaces for people. So the co-working movement, working from home, that started well before COVID. I mean, it's accelerated quite a bit since, but um, the rise of um, of uh, working from the distance and from different, different places is something that was, that was strongly associated in uh, on Twitter uh, with with uh, these kind of um, locations, and then interestingly, um, in the second most used hashtags, uh, increasingly went from fo something focused on work to on ESS, which in French is um, économie sociale et solidaire, so social and solidarity economy. So again, there's been a move towards linking this kind of cultural uh, infrastructure with um, with local uh, uh, social social economy um, development, and that's because I think that there's been an attempt to integrate it more fully into planning and and uh, and. Um, urban development practice. So just a few, two more slides on this, um, on the results. Um, we also looked at kind of the values that the sites projected and what they said about themselves versus the values that people mentioned in relation to them. And this is interesting, you know, as a kind of, uh, it was mentioned in the, in the previous presentation by Sophie, that how, can we crowdsource some information about what people value in heritage? This isn't specifically about these sites as heritage as such, but it is about what people think that they're, what's their worth, what's their value. And interestingly, there's, there's a bit of a, di a divergence in the way that the sites, at least the ones that we um, worked on or looked at, define themselves and their values and the way that other people talk about them. So there's been a lot of the, a lot of the sites um, themselves talk about um, cooperation, creativity, sharing, whereas online people tend to focus more on um, on hosting, so hosting in the sense of like hosting people. Um, and interestingly, that probably emerged from, or at least we can link it to the um, the refugee crisis in Europe and, and also um, in France, at least the fact that these spaces were um, temporarily and then more permanently used as as housing for unhoused and uh, and indigenous people. So they've become, there's a social uh, housing aspect has been incorporated into these spaces over time. And that emerges very clearly from the data. Um, and finally, we tried to establish a kind of typology of, of places. Like, can we say that there is, is it possible using this information from social media and the, the self definition week, like wiki space? Can we talk about um, types, typo a typology of, of these cultural spaces? Um, we tried to do that. It didn't quite work. They're all, interestingly, they all define themselves somewhat differently. So they have different values based on uh, their local needs, which in some ways speaks to this idea that each of them is quite unique, which is something that they, they say about themselves. But in any case, it's hard to, at least with the limited data set that we had to um, to understand uh, whether there were kind of types of, of uh, tier that, that were out there. And I'll, I'll conclude on this. Um, basically, this was a test in some ways. It was a test of whether this methodology works. It's been used on lots of other types of, um, of uh, information, but very rarely on uh, cultural infrastructure, on heritage sites. And so we were just trying to see if it worked. It did, interest, it did produce some interesting results. Uh, the next step to kind of make it more rich and more um, meaningful in some ways would be to expand the corpus of, of documents that we use to include local development, planning applications and things like that to see how maybe the self definitions of these places compares to the actual legal and regulatory definitions that are out there. Also to include a geographical element could be very interesting to see if there's any patterns that emerge in terms of space. Um, in any case, the, um, this, this was a, an attempt to use natural language processing and text mining as a way to understand how heritage sites exist online because they increasingly, uh, that's part of their, their mandate and their mission is to exist online um, and not just in physical space. And so we wanted to see how that relates to what people say about them. Um, and that's, yeah, that's where my, my current uh, research work is at. And I'd be happy to field any questions after this, of course. Um, thank you. Thank you, Iman. Um, Q&A, as I said, will be at the end of the old presentations. So I hand over to our second speaker, who is Raffaella De Marco, with the talk, The Contribution of Digital Heritage and 3D Information Systems to Support Developing Programs on Built Heritage in the Middle East. Raffaella holds a PhD. She's an engineer and an architect. She is an MSCA fellow at the University of Pavia in Italy, and she's also a researcher at the Dada Lab. She's also a young member of the Europa Nostra Network and an ESAC member.
Her research focuses on the development of databases and reality-based models on cultural and endangered heritage for conservation, valorization, and management protocols following international policy, policy requirements. She participates in uh, international research mission on UNESCO sites, in particular in the Middle East and Palestinian territories for range-based and photogrammatic photogrammetic documentation at architecture and urban scale. Her goal is to define 3D digital databases, structural and urban models, and to elaborate informative management systems. So, Rafaela, whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear to me. Uh, yes, we do. Okay, Th thank you very much for this opportunity of presentation and for the very interesting topic of the talk of today. Uh, I come here exactly from my background as architect and engineer talking about the digital heritage. It's something that nowadays everybody probably knows or has heard from somewhere. Um, from my architectural point of view, I mainly focus on the tangible aspect of documenting cultural heritage and in particular on the built heritage side. Um, I don't want to lose too much time on the different opportunities that are available nowadays to make a digital transformation of, from the physical heritage to the digital one. We have more professional or hand users uh, different strategies that are coming smarter each day. But uh, uh, the main topic is that every time that we transpose a uh, physical heritage site in a digital version, we um, try to reach to collect different data to exactly represent and transpose the real configuration of heritage. It's something that we call reality-based modeling, just when we uh, start from surveyed data, not projectual data or um, archival data, and we try to transform them in an accurate and reliable representation of heritage that can reach different scales, for sure, from the presence, the identity of a place on territory, still to different features that come to shape, to textures, to information about materials, and not only. Uh, we can also add information from census, from other kind of sources that can be linked to the shape. My experience uh, has been particularly developed in, in, Palest in Palestine, in Palestinian territory in the last years. They have been the greatest experience of my PhD studies. And um, why we, we talk about the digital transformation of heritage in this context? Because this kind of heritage also has in other contexts that belong to clustered territories with many stratification and coexistence of different cultural sites, uh, face every day a continuous transformation, a continuous uh, adaptability to the infrastructural point of view, to the different activities and functions of communities, to their needs. So uh, it's uh, a situation where also considering the, the different um, management and administration of territories, we cannot have predictable scenarios. I mean, every day uh, things can change, different policies can be applied, and we cannot control the features and the conservation of heritage without applying a good documentation and monitoring process. Uh, what has been done till today and what I have learned in this year, also thanks to this project of cooperation between Italy and Palestine, 3D Bethlehem, uh, coordinated by the University of Pavia, is that uh, we can adapt uh, a good reality-based survey, so reality-based products and models, to conceive not only a shape information, a feature shaping geometrical information, but also to link other types of information that can come from the urban side, from the territorial one, the technological, uh, the legislation on cultural heritage also. And with this kind of information linked to the shapes of model, just as to map, to have a, a guiding map uh, to move within uh, big heritage sites also, we can organize the simulation and try to predict 
many and many variants of scenarios that can be applied starting from this data. Here we can see, for example, a structural simulation in the case of rehabilitation of historical aggregates of a wash. We are in the Arabic side also, or the mapping through the uh, geographic information systems on the different qualities, functions on territory to always have under control the organization and the attributes to heritage. And which kind of attributes? Yeah, this is another open question. And I think that uh, every kind of field of profession has uh, his own one. But uh, in our case of architecture, we have tried to focus on four main fields, the social, the economic, the cultural, and the archaeological one, where everyone conceives a different uh, attribute, class of attributes that we can connect to heritage and also can we can connect to the digital replica of heritage. It's exactly the, the step that links the shape, the digital shape, to the development of a digital ontology. And uh, it's something that I hope we will have future opportunities also to, uh, to see together because it's part of uh, this new project, Moebius, recently funded by the, the My Curie program. Uh, where I will have the opportunity to collaborate not only with the University of Pavia, but also with the Halkutsi University in Jerusalem and the uh, Europa Università Biadrina in Frankfurt Oder in Germany, where we will try exactly to uh, study, to understand the attributes that are linked to values and features that uh, um, developing agencies and programs are looking for, to uh, organize predictable scenarios and to link them to digital shapes. In the way to organize uh, uh, hierarchies of ontologies and informations that can guide not only the mapping of sites on territory, always speaking in a digital point of view, but also the um, um, query of these uh, information systems to understand the systems of values that characterize this cultural stratification of of knowledge on uh, on heritage and uh, i just want to conclude with uh, a question to let everyone think on on itself and even together uh, how do you think that digital replicas uh, can influence the attribution of value to cultural heritage now that we can have one physical heritage and infinite replicas of digital of the same sites in a digital way how can values can change between one and another. I hope that it can be uh, even inspiring in some ways. So thank you very much for the presentation. I think that I'm, I'm a little out of time, so I hope that it doesn't be so critical. <laughs> Yeah, don't worry about it. It was a fantastic presentation, really. And now, uh, off to our last speaker, uh, Miranda Zinuki-Lasse, with a presentation on the role of digital transformation in sustainable management of cultural heritage. Uh, let me briefly introduce Miranda. Uh, she's a doctoral student in management program at Caucasus University, where she's developing a very interesting project on sustainable cultural heritage management. Uh, Miranda holds a BA in uh, Business Administration and Tourism, which is also what she studied in the uh, MA at Budapest Business School. Miranda, whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you very much for your in introducing me, and uh, thank you that you give me the possibility to make a short uh, presentation about the digital transportation in the cultural heritage and uh, the sustainability principles. Uh, so, uh, well, to briefly to summarize about the digital transformation, uh, uh, which was also already mentioned. So nowadays, digital digitalization is the uh, is going on at any time and any place where the tangible heritage, language, and traditions uh, exist. Um, Artifacts, uh, artifacts, uh, archival documents, books, photos are being produced digitally, uh, and uh, a specialized standard that approach is supported to automate this uh, uh, process. 
Uh, cultural heritage represents the feature of a distinct collection of cultural values inherited from the past, preserved in the current time, and supported for the uh, beneficial value for the future generation. The cultural artifact, technology, stories, and traditional lifestyle of the local community in which cultural diversity was generated would be lost without the sustainable um, sustainable management. Um, in the context context of globalization, smart actions for the content uh, use should be carried out to provide sustainability of national identity. Uh, cultural heritage support uh, um, social development, such as uh, mutual understanding, uh, uh, creative thinking, social cohesion, which creates positive atmosphere of the destination. Effective, effective digitalization means that constant introduction of uh, newly produced digital uh, cultural resources, and this consequently requires to flexible system creation and long-term use of sources for the purpose of research, development, decision making, and knowledge transformation to the cognitive, um, cognitive to the cognitive level. Um, uh, before the digital technology utilization in the cultural heritage management, there was a tradi uh, old model uh, which was uh, which was related to the lack of uh, community or not all the, only the community lack of people interaction and engagement, and uh, they was lack uh, less uh, experience with the interaction with the cultural heritage resources. So nowadays, the um, uh, digital transformation uh, forces the, and gives the possibility to ensure the interaction so especially in, in case of the children uh, who are often difficult to attract to a museum or gallery as they tend to see this as a boring experience but the use of interactive technologies such as virtual reality has changed that perception and open up new uh, new spaces for the new um, audience um, adoption of the uh, digital technologies such, such as uh, um, augmented reality or the virtual reality technologies in cultural heritage emerged the innovation technology adaptation uh, you know, and the communication development between visitors and local community and this uh, informative and entertaining practice is strictly related to the sustainability. These settings uh, uh, employ interaction as a mean of the communicating information to the general public in a new uh, and exciting um, ways. It, uh, the pandemic um, changed the um, pandemic increase to uh, digital technology uses in the uh, especially in the cultural heritage management for instance uh, um, online shows organized by cinema theaters um, visual arts however this fact suggested that positive practical implications uh, particularly uh, museums uh, which uh, increased uh, around the 85 percent throughout the uh, during the lockdown contributed to the social medium. Uh, the cooperation is one of the important significant uh, issues regarding to the digital transformation, digitalization policies. Uh, while it ensures so uh, electronic access of cultural heritage from all over the all over the world, and uh, it uh, advantage people and avoid them with any geographical restrictions. For that reason, digitalization awareness should be positively developed and encourage the uh, other countries to be a part of this contemporary um, policy. Uh, for the end, um, uh, you you presented a very interesting uh, project, but the, the, this is uh, some uh, basic questions, or we can discuss uh, later on about this. Uh, of course, there are some disadvantages as well, uh, with the advantage of the digital transformation, why we are using and why there are why while it is utilized in the cultural heritage. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Miranda. Um, that was really interesting. And uh, thank you to actually all our speakers.
for the insightful presentations. And uh, I believe that we can now uh, open the floor to questions, comments. Uh, since we are nearly at around eight, we think that maybe you can, if you want, if you're able to, we can stay on the call up until, um, let's say, half uh, ten past eight, so for uh, our audience to uh, ask. Ask your question or any way to have a little bit of a debate. I have a question for Sophie. Um, from the Europeana Archive, what type of media do you find is most interacted with? Do you have that kind of information or do you see that kind of information? And maybe has it changed over time? Thank you. Uh, interesting, interesting question. And um, I can't give a, a definitive answer because I don't have the current user statistics of, uh, of Europeana in front of me. But we do see that the two by far most popular mediums for interaction that also perhaps allow for the widest range of storytelling opportunities are definitely photography and AV content. Of course, with AV content, um, we are kind of uh, accelerating our pace to catching up with, uh, I would say, modern IPR regulations. Because until a year, a few years ago, it was so, so difficult to use moving images and sound clips for any purpose uh, but education, uh, research, or sometimes not even that. So encouraging people to get hands-on and to get creative with AV collections has been really a struggle so far. But we see things are changing now and they are changing rapidly. This is an extremely important but also interesting path to take because these 20th century AV collections, they document a very recent past that casts uh, many, many shadows on the present. So these stories are so important to, to tell. And if we can use moving images, it brings the, re that recent past uh, reality very, very close to people. So I would say there's a large untapped potential in the AV collections that we're now only starting to explore. When it comes to photography, it has always um, fascinated me how many people are uh, uh, really passionate about photography, especially the very early oeuvres of photography with uh, silver gelatin uh, glass plates, the daguerreotypes, you know, when really there was this materiality also in photographic material. This is something that for many people holds uh, a very strong emotional value because our memory of having picture albums and actually Polaroids uh, in our hand, that memory is very fresh. Of course, now we're doing everything via our smartphones, but many people hold that tangi tangible um, aspect of photographic heritage very, very dear. So this is perhaps a reason why we see that any editorial, any gallery, any content published around early photography is extremely popular with uh, Europeana end user audience. So for me as a curator, I, I, it would be impossible to pick. They, all these materials have their challenges and their, their perks. But for end users, yes, I think uh, these, these two tracks are the most exciting and rewarding. Thank you very much for your answer. May I just... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Elizabeth, I was finished. Ah, okay, I, I was just wondering if I can use my chair's privilege to ask a question uh, and if people in the audience want to ask questions and want to, I don't know, you don't want to ask your question out loud, you can always type it in the chat and we will read your question out loud for you. Uh, I have a question for Eamon and I do not know if maybe I didn't pick it up while you were uh, talk talking or and telling us about your work, but uh, is there any role uh, in your project that is um, dedicated to memory in when you do your analysis about the buildings, functions 
uh, maybe you said it, but you know, like uh, in terms of uh, emotional memory, for instance, is, is it any in many cases relevant for your work? Yes, <clears throat> thank you. That's a good question. Um, in, uh, in in natural language processing and, and using text as data. Uh, for heritage purposes and otherwise, there's there's actually a lot of um, space for what's called semantic analysis. So understanding how people are feeling um, through what they express, and um, we can definitely measure that through uh, looking at comments on, uh, for example, when people comment online on exhibits or the way that they interact through audio text or other um, other means, um, and depending upon how long we want to look back. I mean, the digital archive is not so old. I mean, in some ways it is, but in other ways it's not. Um, we can, we're beginning to build a kind of um, uh, a historical memory of, um, uh, of cultural spaces online, but it's, it's relatively recent that we have the tools to analyze them in the way that we can. Um, so I would, I would say, yes, it is an important thing. And there are tools, um, semantic analysis is, is an important, it's often used, more in advertising, actually, so to understand how people are feeling about something by the way that they comment on on a website, on Amazon, or what what have you, that's being applied now to um, how they interact with culture and with cultural artifacts. Um, but I'd say it's a relatively recent uh, approach. So the data is there. Um, the the it's it's a fresh field of research. Okay, thank you. I was speaking as a person that doesn't know a lot about this uh, topic. And uh, can I ask a question uh, to Miranda as well? Um, I was uh, mostly because sometimes uh, visiting museums or um, some cultural heritage places that are, um, especially actually, I was mostly thinking about museums and especially those that are uh, housed in uh, palaces. Um, thinking, I'm from Italy, so I was thinking of mostly Italian museums. And sometimes uh, the Wi-Fi connection isn't really good. So I was wondering how uh, you overcome, uh, or if you consider what, why during your research, if you have encountered this uh, difficulty in uh, the analysis of your data, if you have reached that, step that level, that stage uh, of you know analysis in your research, if it, this is uh, just... Uh, at the beginning, I wonder if you have noticed uh, some, I don't know, barriers so you can come in your project about, you know, technical issues. So thank you very much for your question. Um, actually, the um, this the information this is secondary data. So and uh, um, I I did not really um, analyze this the the, the uh, technical issue in the uh, museum. I was more concentrated on the interaction with the people and community and visitors and community interaction. Uh, but uh, um, as what I can say that this is. Uh, it was mentioned the technology uh, as technology is high quality high quality and it ensures the uh, even the um, uh, qualified the uh, access to the information and translation and even it uh, it uh, uh, encouraged to the um, even the children to be involved in this proce process so interesting they they should be um, interesting in this process i i hope that i answered your question but uh, um, frankly speaking i in, but uh, the most concentration, the analysis was on the um, interaction between the visitors and community because of the sustainability. I would I would concentrate it on the how the local community are engaged in this process, which which is the one of the uh, benefit of the sustainability and which is referred to the social sustainability. Okay, this actually answers my question. Thank you very much. Thank you. And it looks like Sophie has a question. Sophie, if you would like to go ahead and ask. Yes, thank you. Uh, a, a brief and a quick question to, to Rafaela, because on her final slide, she posed an extremely intriguing question and um, about the value, uh, the value proposition of working with digital cultural heritage. And I wanted to ask her, what is her, uh, Rafaela, what is your 
perception, your impression as to what answers our European cultural policymakers might have to that question? Because I see in recent publications, reports and calls kind of two value, two strands of value proposition, one very much economic, uh, encouragement to work with SMEs, creative industries, create job opportunities, uh, new lines of, of, of produce and so on. On the other hand, there's very much this um, accent on matters of diversity and inclusion, so where it's the societal benefit of uh, digital cultural heritage that is uh, enhanced. So I wanted to, uh, my impression is completely mixed and uh, I think you are perhaps even closer to the topic, so I was curious for your uh, opinion. Thank you very, very much, Sophie. Also, my, my idea is completely in trouble because uh, it's uh, a very uh, dynamic context, a very dynamic uh, discussion in these days. And um, I can say, because I work in a, in a university, so I can also say from the point of view of education, that nowadays uh, European students are really looking forward the management of digital heritage before the management of uh, physical heritage. That it's something uh, very strange from, uh, from our generation, from our point of view, even if I'm not sold, but um, uh, they see the, the potential in, uh, in the digital replica that goes beyond the geographical limits, uh, the conflict that can happen and so on. And sometimes they lose the perception on the real er heritage, on the physical one. The COVID experience uh, has not supported also this uh, different perception of it. And uh, nowadays there is also the whole the topic about the NFT uh, properties that are coming on uh, uh, on the news about the digital replicas. Well, uh, from my point of view, I can say that uh, no digital replica can uh, can ever substitute the physical one. When I when I talk to communities, when I talk to people uh, on site, and they talk about uh, or maybe little uh, macams, little uh, tombs or shrines that exist, nobody knows, but they know the story that is linked to them, uh, the the historical presence, the story of their family. I perceive feelings that probably nobody will reproduce uh, in, uh, in, in, in face of our, a digital replica. So it's the, the link with the community, the emotional link with communities that makes the value of the physical heritage. Yeah, thank you for that. And this, this in turn, it doesn't exclude uh, either of both uh, policy visions, right? Because emotionality is uh, 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 an important economic good as well. So this makes it all the more important to for us to also develop uh, an ethical view on this and to avoid, again, misappropriation of collections uh, deeply rooted in communities. But um, yeah, thank you for, for that point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much to you. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other questions or comments, I believe that we can bring our event to a conclusion. Uh, thank you all very much for your presentations and for your contribution to today's talk. Um, if this is the first time that you joined our events, please follow the ESAC profiles where you will find the uh, updates on all our events and uh, you can also have the opportunity to share your ideas about cultural heritage as well. And thank you all again for your participation and hope to see you all again soon to our next talk.